Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. It's part two of the December Q&A for 2021, getting the year right as the end of the year rolls in. Um, yeah, if you missed part one, that'll be already up on the channel. So go back and check that one out for the first half of the questions. And yeah, I believe we're only going to be doing two parts of questions this month. So this will be the last one. And then we've got some more interesting stuff coming up just to tide you over in that sort of between Christmas and New Year period where all of you guys will be hopefully celebrating and having fun and yeah, wrapping up this year. So yeah, let's get to the questions. But before we do that, Today's video sponsor is Thermal Grizzly and their Cryonaut Extreme, which is now available in a 2 gram syringe. This high performance thermal paste delivers maximum thermal conductivity thanks to an extremely small particle size and layer thickness. It's also very flexible, capable of standing up to sub-zero temperatures for extreme overclocking, but also performs exceptionally well for air and water cooling applications. So if your CPU or GPU needs repasting, then I suggest checking out the Thermal Grizzly range. Link is in the video description. How big of an impact does FOV or field of view have on game performance? Fog. Are you a gamer? Do you even game? <laughs> this well, guy. <laughs> it is, if it is essentially rendering more game world, it would seem performance should be heavily impacted. With most games defaulting to 75 FOV, <laughs> wouldn't my game run much worse if I increased it to 105 plus to overcome motion sickness? Yeah, well, the field of view. <laughs> Yeah, I get what you're saying there. I guess a couple of things like obviously the pixel count isn't changing. The resolution is the resolution. I guess it, de it depends because if you're in, an, uh, let's say you're playing, um, I don't know, a cyberpunk type game and you're indoors, changing the field of view while you'll see more of the room. I don't think it's rendering too much difference in the scene there. Yeah. And likewise, if you're in an, an outdoor environment, and you, you change it there, you're still rendering roughly the same thing. Um, so the only time it would really change is if you're indoor, but increasing the field of view starts to render outdoors. I'm not sure really what that does, to be honest. I haven't looked into it. But what I have looked into is in the same sort of scene, adjusting the field of view from like the minimum slider to the maximum. And it makes next to no difference. We're talking like maybe a couple of percent sort of margin of error differences. So just last night, I'm interested to look at this again. I looked at it years ago because when we used to test games, people asked what field of view are you using? Because, you know, that can change the performance of the game. I'm like, oh, really? That's interesting. I looked into it. I'm like, no, it doesn't really. So I tested Battlefield 5 last night. And I think the minimum field of view in that game is 50 and the maximum is 105. And between 50 and 105, there was like two FPS difference. So that was an, an outdoor environment, made no difference. And obviously the, the scene itself changed quite considerably because that's a big variation in field of view. Yeah, I think the theory or the thinking behind that it would have a performance in increase or performance decrease as you widen the FOV is that you're rendering theoretically, more objects because you're going from this narrow view of a few objects to this big view of lots of objects. But there's more considerations than that. Depends on how the so, game engine handles yeah, that it's, as it's well. How, the, you know, how much of the game engine is being rendered that you're not seeing because yeah. you know, parts of the frame are still going to be, you know, they, tr they try and color as much as they can, but certain parts are still going to be rendered. And then when you increase the field of view, what happens to the level of detail for the small objects on screen? You may get the situation where, yeah, more objects are loaded, but some of those objects are being loaded now at a lower quality because they're not as large on the screen. Of course, that depends on the, the game engine and how they manage it. Again, it doesn't make much of a difference, which suggests that the any differences in geometry load that we see are not a significant factor for the performance. And it's more the shading aspect of things, the actual, you know, in doing all that shading work on your big GPU and doing it at 4K or whatever. Yeah, another interesting big, yeah, sort of tidbit is as well, I loaded up Battlefield 5 at 105 and I noted the VRAM usage after five minutes of gameplay, changed it to 50, shut the game down, relaunched it, played again, exact same VRAM uh, allocation or, or usage. Yeah. So. Didn't change anything there. I, I imagine that'll have a lot to do with the pr the items probably have to be loaded in anyway because if you move around, that's right. You don't want to be moving and then having to load all that. Same stuff thing in, with coloring so. as well. You can only do yeah. so much before you're unoptimizing the game. Yeah, and potentially there's advantages there to keeping some of that geometry in the engine. Again, we're not game developers. Mm. We can only report on what the facts are in terms of performance, and the performance suggests that it's not that big of a deal. So, yep. all right, Tim. <laughs> 
<laughs> what do you think of NVIDIA's recent relaunch of the 2000 series GPUs? Well, it was really only 2060, wasn't it? But it's a 2000 series yeah, GPU. Yeah, and I think there's been what, rumors of like a 2050 or yeah, something actually, for I did. laptops, yeah. or, which yep. I guess isn't a relaunch because they never made that to mm -hmm. begin with. Um, yeah, what do I think of the relaunch? Well, in theory, it would have been a good idea to produce a whole ton of Turing GPUs on an older node and make them widely available and affordable. So the theory there, it's very nice. Increase availability because you're not using the same node. In practice, though, the 2060 12 gigabyte seems very much like a mining card. Mm -hmm. um, that's from speaking with people in the industry who are sort of involved with this and sort of just assessing where the product lies is that it is far too expensive based on the actual retail price of the very few available models that you can get. It's priced very close to a 3060, which is just insane. And then, yeah, it, the performance just doesn't justify that price. But obviously the added performance that you get, especially on the VRAM side, does benefit mining. It mm -hmm. still has a very high level of mining performance. So... Yeah, it would have been nice if the 2000 series was relaunched in big supply so that, you know, we could get some more nodes being used, get some more capacity being used. But in practice, it doesn't seem to be benefiting gamers all that much, at least with this release. And I don't think we'll see too many more releases. So, yeah, I guess from that sense, it's a bit disappointing. But again, you know, companies like NVIDIA are trying to make as much money as possible. So making more mining sort of GPUs is going to make them more money. So that's just the way things are. Okay, so this next question has a, a link to an article from TFT Central, so we might show that on screen briefly while we talk about this. Uh, do you plan to add disclosure on what HDMI 2.1 part is supported on monitors for all monitor reviews going forward? So I think this is based on the recent, I don't know whether you'd call it a controversy or not, but let's call it a controversy, around um, HDMI 2.0 being effectively renamed to HDMI 2.1, causing lots of confusion for customers so as it would yeah not super happy with this in terms of yeah i don't think it's a great way for a standards body to run if they're just renaming existing standards to be the same as new standards it's that does not benefit consumers in any way the only thing this could possibly do is benefit uh manufacturers and oems in a very dodgy manner because they can now make crappier products that do not use the new features that are supposed to be part of hdmi 2.1 so they get to save money and potentially the hdmi licenses can still charge the same fees for hdmi 2.1 that they've been doing for this whole time so yeah it's very misleading it's dodgy not a fan and certainly we're going to have to assess more the hdmi 2.1 capabilities of monitors moving forward and even though monitors may be technically allowed to display HDMI 2.1 on ports that are just HDMI 2.0, I will be destroying any monitor manufacturer that does that. So that's a this is a warning to you. If you're a monitor manufacturer watching this video, which I'm not sure why you would, don't do this because I will make some nice clickbait that will make your life difficult. So use HDMI 2.1 if you're using HDMI 2.1 features. And yeah, if you try and mislead your customers, yeah, I'm not going to be very happy with you. So yeah, we'll certainly be looking more into this. Anything that seems dodgy and needs to be investigated, we will certainly be looking at. So yeah, look for that in our monitor reviews next year. If prices don't return to anything resembling MSRP by the launch of the next gen of GPUs, will the reviews be focused on actual retail price instead? What do you think, Steve? I mean, I don't think it'll change because we don't know the actual retail price when we do a day one review. Uh, you'd have to go back and watch my recent product reviews, like the 6600, 6600 XT. I think even for um, after it became quite evident that Ampere wasn't going to hit those MSRPs, we did our best to sort of look at what the other cards were selling at and do yep. a, like a percentage adjustment there. So, yeah, I, I, if there's... If the GeForce 4000 series was launching tomorrow, I would give you an MSRP graph and do a, a, a sort of, you know, a fairy mythical, com a mythical <laughs> comparison with the, the, the other cards that never hit their MSRP. And then really the conclusion would be, I don't know, like wait until it goes on sale and see what it's priced at, but it's not going to be good because the market's not good. So really yeah. at that point, value, cost per frame, all that stuff, basically all the things that matter about buying a product go out the window. It's like, how does it perform? Oh, okay, it's actually 
50% faster. That's awesome. So what am I willing to pay for that? That's what well, am I willing to pay $3,000 for that? Because if I am, maybe they'll, yeah. they'll, but yeah, price and value will be not something that we focus heavily on. Like, so here's the uh, claimed MSRP. Mm -hmm. Here's how it yeah. performs, which is ultimately what you're going to need to know. Yeah, and I think over the past year, it's we've gotten better at predicting these things because often prior to a GPU's launch, we can gather from industry contacts things like the level of supply that these cards are going to have. You know, is this going to be better or worse than previous launches? Sort of the expected volumes of things that we can, you know, we can gather and sort of the expected sort of, you know, is this going to be expensive or not sort of type thing when it comes to AOB cards and that sort of thing is all things that we can gather, not with extreme enough accuracy to say it's this is going to be the price. But I think over the past year or so, we can sort of, we will know when it comes to this next generation of products, whether these cards are going to be disgustingly overpriced mm. straight off the bat or not based on these sorts of cues and information, which is going to be useful for these reviews because we can factor that in and sort of saying, oh, this is a, you know, the MSRP is listed at this, but we've heard availability is going to be very low and that is almost certainly going to drive the price up to a level that's more like this. And even that's a shot in the dark because like the 6600 XT was so frustrating because AMD was constantly ringing me, getting in my ear about how there's going to be great supply. They're going to hit these prices, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, we've seen this before, though. I don't believe you. No offense, but I don't believe you. Oh, yeah. you know, we've secured. And then you talk to retailers and like, oh, well, actually, you know, the first shipment is hitting like, I think it was 700 Australian dollars or something like that off yep. from memory. And then as it gets close to launch, the retail is like, but it looks like the price is going up straight after anyway. And then it went straight to what yep. we estimate it would be. But then reviews went live, stock hit shelves, and people were saying, oh, you've been too harsh on this product. It is this price you know it's way cheaper than the geforce part and then sure enough what was it like two three weeks later the price was back up where we yeah. expected it to be so it went the other way yeah but so i think all of that stuff is going to be factored into the yeah. next generation of gpus like companies trying to pull that stuff of having effectively a fake msrp at launch and then prices just going up straight away after that are all things that we're going to have to talk about in these reviews basically saying stuff like Yes, you may be able to get this at launch for this price, but you know that's not going to be the standard. Oh, if we get information yeah. that says that's also, going to be also, the guys, we're doing all the work for you. Like we're doing ninety something percent of the work for you. And this is sort of like a bit frustrating when people are like, "Oh, your review wasn't that useful to me because I'm in this region that you know we're completely unaware of what is available in your region, and the prices are different." It's like, yeah, okay, well, you've got a. 12 or 30 game average that's comparing all of the relevant products for you. You have the exact performance across a wide range of games. Take those data points and then, you know, look at the price, which one makes more sense yeah, for you. Like you've got, you know, sometimes yeah. you're, so at the end of the day, this sort of stuff, it's kind of irrelevant because you'll see the performance, as I said, you know, is it going to be, is it 30 or 40% faster? And then what sort of premium is that worth paying? And if the, if they're absurdly expensive and you're not worth it, it's not worth that to you, then you, you don't buy it. Or if they're unavailable, you can't buy it. So mm. really with the reviews, look at the performance and you, you have to make your own sort of cost analysis there. Yeah, and I think with the next generation as well, it, it's an opportunity for these companies like NVIDIA and AMD to reset the MSRP to a value that is more reflective of the true price. Yeah, I doubt they'll do that though. But th I guess what I'm saying is that even though I as well doubt that they will do this, I think that they deserve to cop serious flack for not doing it. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I think I can understand this generation how it is very difficult to release part of a GPU series at a price that you were probably expecting it to hit. Things go really badly with availability and then you've, you're launching these new products and you're saying well I, I have to price this msrp cheaper than the higher tier cards otherwise it doesn't make sense even though i know the re actual retail price is going to be high i can sort of forgive that but if you're going to yeah. release a new generation it's like it's a reset so these companies have to in my opinion make the msrp more reasonable so i think it is going to be a period of 
resetting, reevaluating how accurate companies are being about these products. And I certainly wouldn't want to see another generation of NVIDIA and AMD misleading. I mean, I guess they weren't attempting to mislead to begin with, but you know what I'm saying. Like Maybe. To... Like, it's sort of the 3080 Ti argument, though, because it's not a situation where AMD is like, oh, we can't sell it for that price and make money. Like, they're making in insane money profits. Yep. So I don't know how unable they are to hit certain prices and what are they actually selling them to their partners for. There's a lot of unknowns there. Mm, I don't think it matters what they're selling it to their partners for. I think what matters is the ultimate price for consumers. And if they're, setting, if they're saying, hey, we can sell these at $1,800 and then the actual price is $3,000... I don't think that they've been particularly, you know, accurate on the MSRP. It's 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 because it's, the, the suggesting suggesting that something sold at eighteen hundred dollars that ends up being sold at three thousand dollars, I don't think is particularly great. Like it's yeah, it's kind of like, wasn't a good suggestion. Yeah, it's a, it's a rough one though because it's like we, as AMD said, we've allowed our partners to hit that price. The MSRP is an achievable target. It's a cop out, though, isn't it? Well, it's a big cop out. But then, but then you go the other way with like an RTX 3080 Ti, which is twelve hundred dollars, and that product didn't need to have an MSRP that high. In fact, it should have been less. In a normal market, it would have had to have been less because it'd be it is a laughable product at that price. Yeah, over the 3080, so which is meant to be seven hundred dollars. So, and it was still sold for more than twelve hundred dollars. Of course, <laughs> but you you know what I mean? Like they've they've increased the MSRP there, and it hasn't helped with the problem, and it's made them look bad. So I don't no, know. No, no, no. I, I'm, what I'm saying, I, I should, I guess, I should clarify is that I don't care if Nvidia looks and AMD look bad doing this, mm. because they will look bad. Mm -hmm. That's just, I guess, that's just part of it. I think the the product, what, what they did with the 3080 Ti is they tried to straddle the two things of we need to increase the MSRP to not make it so ridiculous, mm -hmm. but they didn't increase it to the level that it was actually going to sell at mm -hmm. because that was higher than the MSRP of the 3090. So they were kind of stuck in this hard position where they tried to they tried to do a bit of it, but it didn't really work. I think that when it comes to a, a new generation of products where they've got this big reset that they now know what these cards are going to sell for. Like, they're not stupid. Like, they could very accurately predict launching a new product in the market right now what it would sell for. Yeah, I don't know what and it would be selling for in six months or 12 months, though. Well, they can lower the price later. I, th like, I guess that's what I was... They have to be accurate. I think they deserve to cop it if, I just if don't they know, do yeah, this again. I guess... I don't know. I'm torn on this one. I have to really, really think about it because... Is it a situation with the 3080 Ti where they're like, oh, okay, so the MSRP is $2,000 and Skull was like, yeah, it's 4000 now. Well, I think there's a limit so, to what these I guess people there are going to pay. Yeah. So like what we see on the scalper market a lot is that some cards like the 3080 Ti aren't as nearly as inflated as the 3070 because mm. you know the, the difference between the price and its performance is a lot narrower. So well, I think- If they do that- I'm just glad I'm not part of it because that just sounds like a nightmare. It's going to be bad because they're going to have to increase the price on these cards massively. But yeah, yeah I, I just think that we've had this, you know, people getting misled mm -hmm. and I really don't like these sort of misleading price points. And I think, yeah, it's not going to, like, I don't think they're going to do it because they'll look bad increasing like a 3070 tier product to $1,500. Like, it's, it's like, gonna look it's like we already know that's the reality. But that really... It's going to sting when they, they make yeah, it the reality, It's like right? that is actually... The, it's like we, we've it's like we've come to terms with it without coming to terms with it type of thing. And that yeah. just that's it. There's no yeah. more hoping that the prices will drop back down to these mythical MSRPs. Like, no, 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 no. They're just not happening anymore. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that one, but I suppose it doesn't really matter because it's... But then, yes, hopefully yeah. supply and demand will take over and lower prices because... Most other GPU generations have seen prices come down yeah. over time. It's just this generation that hasn't happened. So, yeah, there's a lot of complicated things going on there, but yeah, we'll see what happens next generation. All right, next question. I've had to sort of shorten this one a little bit. It was a very long question, but here's the gist of it. In the past, both of you seem uninterested in doing content collaborations with other YouTubers. The reason being that it just takes time away from making dedicated channel content, which is perfectly valid. What are your thoughts and do you think that you would ever consider doing a collaboration? So I think 
part of this question about not doing collabs because they take away from our main content, it's probably not the main reason. I think the main reason is more we we live in Australia and everyone else lives in other parts of the world, especially the US and other time zones, which makes it very difficult to do those sorts of things. Just from like, yeah. you know, I think collab, collabs have the best impact when, you know, you can get together in person and sort of do something fun, which a lot of people in the US can do because you can just fly around. For us, it's like, hmm, we can spend that 20 hour flight to the US to do that sort of content. I mean, even guys like Jared's tech who yeah. would be the closest to us, it's still going to take him an entire day just to get to me. Yeah. And then if we film for a day, then it's going to take him an, an entire day to get home. So effectively, he loses three days for a one-day visit. Yeah. And you've got to make it worth it for both parties. Yeah. So you can't expect Jared to take three days out of his life away from his channel to come and appear on our channel. I mean, you know, it can be beneficial to advertise his channel on our channel, I suppose. But we're also happy just to give him a free <laughs> shout out. Uh, but we definitely would like to to get together with guys like Jared and and do some content in the future. So, yeah, we'll, we'll try and make that happen. Yeah, I think the, those are the... Re it, yeah, it's, it's not so much about, yeah, for us making contents, taking away from other content. It's certainly something I would like to do, but it's always... I've always felt it's made the most sense to do collabs at events like Computex where everyone's sort of there and you can, you know, hopefully there's a day at the end or something where people are sort of cooling down and you can organize stuff like that, which, yeah, would make the most sense. Um, and obviously that hasn't been possible the last couple of years because of reasons everyone is aware of. So, yeah, I certainly would like to do more collabs and that sort of thing. The time zone thing as well for Australia, if we try to get people involved from other countries is... A challenge mm -hmm. so doing sort of like you know maybe split screen chats and that sort of thing can be difficult but yeah we're not against it so yeah i mean we've got another i was recently on um moore's law is yep. dead having a chat with tom for i think two hours or yeah, thereabouts so jared and i were in the u.s one time and i got him on the channel <laughs> as well so yeah it's just everyone's busy trying to coordinate these things is hard and mm -hmm. yeah hopefully it's something that we can yeah think about doing in the future mm-hmm Okay, what is your advice on buying a forecast? Oh, it's another monitor question. <laughs> Too many monitor questions this month, guys. I'm not. I'm not answering enough questions. I'm going to actually. Maybe I'll start by answering this oh, one. Oh, do it. So let's. Oh, I'm uh, interested in your thoughts now. Yeah. Uh, all I know is it says 4K monitor. I have a 4K monitor, so therefore I'm an expert on this yep, one. Absolutely. Um, what is your advice on buying a 4K monitor for mainly 1440p gaming and occasional 4K gaming? Does the resolution look better or worse or the same as native 1440p monitor? Uh, based on that, I think you'd be much better off buying a 1440p monitor. Yep. Cool. Yep. All right, I'll continue. Because, <laughs> uh, for example, I have a 4K monitor, which I primarily use for work, but because I haven't built a separate gaming system, I still game on it. And some of the games I do have to dial back to 1440p, and it is noticeably blurry because of that, at least on more, my 4K panel, though I expect that to be the norm. Yeah, it is. I think, yeah, when, when this question says, does the resolution look better, worse, or the same, it definitely looks worse mm -hmm. um, than a native 1440p monitor. This is why integer scaling is such a popular feature for some people where you can run 1080p at 4K mm -hmm. and you know, you're matching one 1080p pixel to four 4K pixels. In that situation, based on what I've seen, it does look basically the same as a 1080p monitor. Yeah. But when you're sort of in that intermediate resolution... It's like bad anti-aliasing. Yeah, you're trying to like turn one pixel into like two pixels, which is kind of a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, there are some exceptions to this. Games that do support more advanced upscaling technologies like DLSS are going to look better running at 4K, but with DLSS rendering the game at 1440p than upscaling it, that will look better because... DLSS is attempting to restore a lot of the detail that you'd normally see at 4K. But if you're just talking about a normal game using normal resolution scaling, hmm. I think things like the UI are not going to look very good. Yep. Um, and you'd certainly want to run the game at the native resolution and use a resolution slider. But even then, as you say, the game does look blurrier and worse, in my opinion, than running the game on a 1440p monitor. So, yeah, my advice would be... if. If you're buying a monitor for gaming and you're planning on playing mostly at 1440p, there's still not enough DLSS games and games like that where I think it's worth having that 4K monitor. I think it's worth buying. Yeah. 1440p. Also, you you're going up a up a resolution where there's less options at much higher prices to maybe sometimes game there. Whereas yep. if you go for 1440p, you have many more options uh, to pick from at 
much more competitive prices. Exactly. So I'd be going yep. 1440p high ref- refresh rate. So that's what monitor Steve reckons. Yep. Okay, question for both of us. What are the best looking graphics cards ever, in your opinion? <laughs> so if we're talking about like graphics card series, like, you know, the Asus Strix generation from blah, yep. blah, 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 or whatever... I think a lot of people are going to sort of hate my answer on this, but I love the look and just the design of the latest generation RTX 3090 Founders Edition, that three-slot behemoth. Yep. I think it looks really cool. I think it feels really cool. It feels like a really premium product, and it's like 2.1 kilos of just behemoth graphics card. So I think that's probably the most impressive graphics card I've ever come across, and I, I, I just think it looks... Yeah, it's, it's a really neat-looking product. Um I or now this is going back quite a way. I always enjoyed the days when you know the PCB wasn't covered with the massive heat sink and you had backplates and all that stuff, but people would like produce red PCBs. The blue, and blue the PCBs. Sapphire, I think it was Sapphire oh, did blue a few other, Yeah, I mean I think yeah, a few companies did blue. In fact, who made the Albatron cards? I think it was Albert Albatron or Albatross That's before or something. My time, I reckon. Albatross, maybe. <laughs> they had a blue. I, I'm, I'm, I may be misremembering this. There's definitely been cards with blue. Yeah, PCBs. and the blue PCB just looked awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna have to Google that in a yeah. minute and find out what they were called. Obviously, GPU designs have gotten much more complex and more aesthetic since then because yeah, you've got yeah. these big, massive cores covering There's, the whole thing. Yeah, but. In the days when you had smaller fans and the PCB was exposed, the colored PCBs were really cool, in my opinion. But I think out of the modern series, mm. yeah, the, the 3090 is a good shout. I think, obviously, the card it, this card itself was bad in terms of its cooler design, but I really liked the design of the Vega cards, the founders, the, not the founders edition, but just the, the stock Vega, where it was a blower card, so obviously the performance... Are you meaning like the fr- Frontier edition, like the Radeon 7? No, the like Vega fifty six, like the black, yeah, with the dots like a, all over. Yeah, it's it just okay. very square design, very okay. simple. Again, if that performed well, it would be sure good because it was very loud. Performance aside, though, performance yeah. aside, I just okay. it's a very simple design. Like, I, didn't, it's not, I didn't like those. Not too much RGB, and you know, f- f- I can hide the fan blades. That's fine with yep. me. No crazy sort of just elements and stuff. Just a box with okay. a hole. I didn't mind that, but obviously okay. you're a hater, so that's fine. Uh, I wouldn't say I hated it. It was just, it was just not not your thing. Yeah, it I, pref- I preferred that look to the Pascal cards of the day, where they had the window and you could see. It I was see, all see, a lot of people hated those. I preferred those. They you were preferred kind of those? cool. Yeah, I preferred that like the Pascal design. Titans were cool. I liked the black ones with yeah. the, the little the little dust window. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, didn't like the Vega cards that much. Um, but I thought the Radeon 7 was kind of a, a sleek, smart-looking yeah, card. The Vega 64 Liquid was a similar vein. That looked kind of cool as yeah. well. Um, yeah, I think that... Isn't it funny? I think the Founders Edition-style cards tend to have better-looking designs than most AIB cards, where they tend to go too heavy on the sort of angles and... RGB elements, which I'm not as much of a fan of. I just yeah. prefer like the nice, clean sort of of the AIB cohesive designs. Yeah, the AIB cards, the um, the Strix cards generally look pretty cool. But they're yeah, the aggressive angles and yeah. like, but they they generally look pretty cool. All right, when do high temperatures become dangerous? My GPU, so a 5700 XT, sometimes runs at 100 degrees in Overwatch. So that's probably the hot spot temperature. Uh, well, dangerous, I guess. It depends on how you define dangerous. So AMD say you can have a hotspot temperature on that particular product of 110 degrees and they expect it to have a normal lifespan. So I suppose anything under that is acceptable, but people can challenge that and say, you know, I think 90 because of reasons, yeah. which is fine, I guess. It's Yeah, I mean, you can go against what the manufacturer says or yeah, you can make up your own standard. Yeah, I think if you're using your card at default settings, like you're not crazily overclocking it and doing stuff like that, then you're never going to run into a situation where it's running too hot because it has overprotection features. Well, they'll downclock as well, yeah. So, yeah, they might downclock and stuff, but it's never going to become dangerous from a sense that your car is going to blow up and die or catch fire. Um, Certainly there are protection mechanisms put in place, one, when running under the standard operating conditions. So... Yeah, generally, if I'm buying a GPU and it's running, you know, fan noise and stuff and temperatures are a consideration because of noise, but I'm never concerned 
about it just, you know, stopping working. Yeah, the dangerous it's, for me is losing performance throttling. Yeah. So you so, want to avoid that for sure. Yeah, I think this question is more about, at least to me, would be if I was overclocking the GPU and sort of what is the temperature that I want to keep it below so that mm -hmm. I'm not damaging my card. And generally, yeah, you can as you say, look up the temperatures that the cards are rated to. And mm -hmm. you probably don't want to run it right at the you know, the limit that the manufacturers say because you're going to run to you know, the potential for throttling. If you if a day is a bit warmer and your card, mm. you know, you've optimized your card for 110 and then the day is like five degrees hotter and then suddenly your card's throttling, that's not ideal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, GPUs are meant to be run at high temperatures and they tend to be fine. Mm -hmm. Do you think a 10p core Outer Lake product would be interesting for desktop use? Um, sort of. The thing, I guess this comes back to like my e core testing thing where I was sort of saying for gamers, two more p cores would be better than the eight e cores, which I still believe. But I also noted in that video, it's like, well, games don't need 10 p cores. So, and again, we're not talking about how many cores games need because that's somewhat irrelevant. It's how powerful the cores are. And P cores are so damn powerful that even six of them just rip through the latest and greatest yep. games without issue. So adding, you know, well, in that case, four more, um, not going to do too much for you. So if there was a 10 P core uh, part that had the same L3 cache capacity, performance would be the same as the 1200K in pretty much every single game because no games use yep. anywhere near 10 P cores. So... While an interesting product, I don't necessarily think it would be a better product. Like, let's even just say for a moment that power consumption would be the same as, yep. as, as the current configuration. Would that be a better product? And it's like, well, for gaming, as I said, at least right now and for the expected foreseeable future, there'll be no difference in terms of gaming performance. And then for productivity workloads, there'll be some where it's definitely going to be faster. Like, it may be faster for a blender type thing. For, for Cinebench, I don't think so because the e-cores seem to work ridiculously well for Cinebench. But code compilation, all that kind of stuff, yeah, it, it may be better. Yeah, I guess the question is, do two P-cores outperform eight e-cores in those productivity workloads? Again, so yeah, it'd I be, think... It, it, it would depend, wouldn't it? Yeah, any of those workloads that have a bit of, you know, core-to-core -core communication, bandwidth latency sensitive, then I think the P-cores would definitely be better. Uh, how we go on power consumption, as I said, that's a whole other thing. But yeah, for, get, for applications that don't have a lot of core-to-core -core communication, very sequential, like Cinebench, for example, then I think the uh, uh, e-cores would be the way to go. And really, you could stack those CPUs e-core heavy for those type of workloads. It's just that not all workloads are like that. Yeah. We've seen that Cinebench just scales incredibly well, like right through Threadripper and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, which is why I think the, you know, the suggestions are that the next generation of... Um, Intel CPUs is going to add more E cores without adding more P cores. And that should be very telling to all these people who have been going on about core counts for gaming and, you know, banging on that drum that we need. You know, this CPU is going to have this many cores and therefore you're going to need that for gaming. So if we know that it's tied very closely to the current generation of consoles, we know how powerful the CPU is there. We know there's going to be, ve like, it's, there's going to be very few outliers that call for that kind of performance for stuff that we've talked about at length in recent Q&As where it's the lowest common denominator. You alienate a huge part of the potential install base from being able to play that title if they need something like a 10-p core CPU. But the fact that Intel's sticking with 8 e core, uh, eight p cores at the, the mainstream or their high-end, basically, desktop gaming parts suggest to you that that's all you're going to require for gaming for quite some time to come. All right, and that wraps us up for the Q&A series throughout 2021. I think it's been a lot of fun doing this Q&A series throughout the year. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy answering all of your questions. And yeah, we tend to always get some pretty interesting ones asked to us every month, which is good because it keeps a little bit of variety in our lives, not just testing yeah. all the time. We get to interact with you guys, which is always great. So yeah, appreciate all of you who've sent questions in throughout the year. Hopefully you had a really nice Christmas period if you, you know, support Christmas or um, do all that sort of stuff. I know not Hashtag everyone does. Not but sponsored. <laughs> we're not sponsored by Christmas, but um, yeah, hope, hope everyone is having a great end of the year. And yeah, I guess, what else is there to say? Not a lot. Um, you could sign up for Float Plan or Patreon for next year. Nice, yeah, nice actually, Christmas present for you. Ten percent off if you sign up for a year, so that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, but yeah, we do live streams. We have an awesome Discord server. We do behind the scenes content, Q and A stuff. A lot of cool things there. So yeah, check it out if you're interested. I guess. 
Yeah, exactly. And ho- hopefully we'll be doing all the same usual stuff next year as well in terms uh, of I'm sure we will. our behind-the-scenes stuff. So. I think next year will be a lot better for, yeah, for, for, for tech hope. anyway. At least I'm hoping so. Yeah, anyway. Well, we're all hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. All right, that'll do this one. Thanks yeah. for watching. I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Steve. Catch you in the next one.